I'm Tom Baker, this is Chasing Cars, and this is the Porsche Taycan Turbo. The Taycan is Porsche's first EV, but you wouldn't know it if you drove it. And that's because this EV rides and handles better than any other electric car on the market. It's actually the suspension of the Taycan which elevates it above and beyond virtually any other electrically propelled vehicle that you can buy. Certainly when you take the balance of the ride and handling and the blend that Porsche have engineered into this car, it makes the Taycan really something very special. And if you get the opportunity to drive one, you should because that's how you can really tell what I'm talking about. But in today's video, I'm gonna do my best to explain how Porsche have managed to get it to this point where it rides and handles unlike any other EV on the market at this point in time, which is December, 2021. On a number of other attributes, it's not the best EV on the market. It doesn't go the furthest, it doesn't charge the fastest, it doesn't accelerate the quickest to 100 kilometers per hour, but it does perform pretty well on all of those metrics. Now the Taycan Turbo, isn't turbocharged, it's not a combustion vehicle, it's a fully electric platform, but in Porsche nomenclature, the turbo sits second from the top, and as it is for the Taycan. The Turbo S is the current flagship, underneath this vehicle is the new GTS, beneath that is the 4S, and at the bottom of the range is just the Taycan, which is rear wheel drive. Now, other people have done the should it be called turbo or not topic to death. I'm just gonna leave it at the fact that that's what it's called, Getting angry in reviews isn't really the chasing car style. Now this particular Taycan is a sedan, but it also comes in cross Turismo cladded wagon form here in Australia, which is a bit of me. Overseas, there's also a sport Turismo wagon without the cladding, currently only offered in GTS specification, which sounds pretty tasty. Now in today's video, before we jump into the Taycan Turbo and talk about what makes this EV very special to drive in terms of its ride and handling, and also it's 500 kilowatt powertrain. We'll do our usual thing. We'll jump inside and we'll check out the interesting specification of this car, which has naturally tanned leather, which is more like a expensive piece of furniture or a travel bag than the usual treated leather that we normally see in virtually any other car. We'll have a look at the back seats, the boot space and the fruit space, and then we'll cover the running costs, how this car charges and what it's gonna cost you to live with before we jump out onto the road. Before we get started, make sure to hit subscribe down below and that notification bell. Buying a $276,000 Porsche means you probably have the cash to actually do the specification well. A black on black depreciation special is probably not what you need to do if you have this level of resourcing. Though it is worth pointing out that the base rear wheel drive Taycan that I think I would probably have um, starts at about half the price of this vehicle. So as you start to work your way up the range in terms of power and performance, you are paying a lot more at each step. Each step is typically about $40,000, uh, but then the step from the Turbo to the Turbo S is about $70,000. So to get the most exclusive, most expensive Taycan, you are paying a lot of money. That being said, one thing that's good about configuring a Porsche is that if you go for the base model, you can still get like everything you want in the interior. You're not limited to some kind of Povo spec because you only have $157,000 to spend on the rear wheel drive version of this car. Anyway, talking about spec, let's have a look at this one because this is something special and something that we don't see every day. This is Olea leather uh, in this Taycan, uh, and it's in an Atacama beige and black two-tone uh, color, and it looks absolutely beautiful. But one of the reasons why it is beautiful is because it's actually natural leather that's been tanned sustainably with olive leaf extract rather than the usual cocktail of um, artificial stuff, uh, which is used to seal leather in most cars. Now, what this means is that um, well, it's more sustainable, but it's also going to have accelerated wear in some areas. So you can see here around the center console and prominently on the bolster of the driver's seat, this leather is getting much darker over time. And this vehicle has about 8,000 kilometers on the clock. So we're starting to see how it will fare. And 
That's why I think these seats are more like a travel bag or a, an armchair in your house. And I think they're very, very beautiful. Um, and it's a combination that I would definitely consider uh, if I were in the market for one of these cars. But you can also get a full uh, animal skin free interior if that's more your bent. This one is not free of animal skin. There's actually leather everywhere, including up here on the dash on the doors. It does feel suitably presentable uh, for just over $300,000 before on-road costs this particular specification. Um, and when you talk about a Porsche, you're usually talking about a fair amount of options, and this car has a few. The Gentian blue outside is actually free, um, so you start with that, uh, but you move on to this interior package, which is about $5,600. The wheels are $9,600. Uh, the Sport Chrono package in this car is just over two grand. The passenger display is just over two grand. Uh, the black pack outside, $1,700. Porsche electric sport sound, which we'll listen to shortly, is just over a thousand. The five seat layout rather than four seats is a thousand dollars on the dot. The LED matrix headlights are nine hundred and ninety dollars. The side window trims in black are seven hundred and twenty. The Porsche courtesy lights are six hundred dollars, and the black script for the model designation uh, is five hundred dollars. So certainly you are kind of equipping the car to be precisely what you want, but we wouldn't pretend that there's you know, too much value for money, uh, but I think the rear wheel drive probably does have that when you consider just how wonderfully this car is suspended. Moving on to the technology package, it's quite something. We've got curved glass here in front of us integrating the digital cockpit. It mimics the analog dials that Porsches have had for decades, but it's fully digital. We can put a map or a full map in front of us with satellite mapping capability. It's really customizable and cool. And then over here, we have dual touchscreens. The passenger can have one for two grand and uh, the passenger iPad in the car has really enjoyed using the screen. The one in the center here runs the latest version of PCM, which is Porsche's infotainment system. It's pretty snappy, it's crisp and bright. It has wireless Apple CarPlay. And there's also a Bose stereo in this car, which sounds pretty good, better than the Bose in the um, Macan that I reviewed recently. Finally, there's an additional screen down here with shortcuts, uh, which links with this screen and also fixed climate uh, displays too, but it does attract quite a lot of fingerprints. So you'll be cleaning that or someone will be cleaning that for you on a regular basis. The secondary trim in this particular car is actually this sort of rose gold, which you get as standard if you go for the Olea leather, but you can choose a variety of, uh, of trims, uh, including more leather, aluminium, carbon fiber if that's your thing, wood. Uh, it's a very customizable interior. And we have this very cool Alcantara headliner with no sunroof, slick top. There you go. Two cup holders here and a small box between the seats with USB-C charging. Meanwhile, the door bins actually can take a one and a half liter bottle of water, which is great in a country like Australia where it gets hot, like right now. Okay, that's the front. Let's check out the back. While the Taycan is a fairly compact sports sedan, uh, you can see that it's actually quite practical for four adults because it is on a long wheelbase with the wheels pushed right to the corners, a hallmark of EVs that sit on dedicated platforms. As this one does, it sits atop the Volkswagen Group PPE platform, uh, which is for upmarket electric cars, effectively the Taycan and the Audi e-tron gt uh, at this point in time uh, and the e-tron gt will come out soon and it's interesting to see how it compares to this car but the Taycan, i fit in the back you can see there's not a huge amount of headroom left there's a half inch or so leg room behind my own driving position is good toe room is a bit weird because the floor kind of slopes up underneath the driver but it's still okay this car has what's called the four plus one seating package for a thousand dollars which gives you a seat belt um, but also kind of kind of a usable seat here, but I think it's emergency use only that one. Most of the time I'd prefer to have this armrest flipped down with two cup holders here uh, and also what appears to be 40-20-40 folding rear seats. Convenient for skis. Down here we've got air vents, we've got another two climate zones, quad zone climate for this relatively small cabin, which is interesting. We've got isofix points easily exposed here and top tether actually behind all three seats, although I don't think you're gonna get um, three baby seats in the back, but two I think you actually could do. So it's comfortable, the seat is inclined nicely, we've got all of this leather, it's leather on the back of the seat, it's just absolutely sumptuous in this car, and door bins for a water bottle too. 
Heading around here to the back of the Porsche Taycan Turbo, we have the Varian written out here in script, akin to virtually any Porsche, and the, the lettering is actually done in black for $500. I'd probably save that uh, because I actually prefer silver detailing, particularly on a Gentian blue car. This one actually has the exterior black pack and the window surrounds in black. It's certainly a look and you know I completely understand if, uh, if that's something that you prefer. Interestingly, the wheels on this particular car are optional 21s, uh, which set you back about $7,000, uh, and then to have them painted in black is a further $2,000. So, yes, I mean, this car is 300 grand, so what's another nine, hey? Anyway, we've got a power tailgate here that opens up this sedan boot conveniently. I've got an overnight bag in here, perfect. This is the kind of car you'd want to take away to the vineyards or something. As you can see, loading height is pretty low. We've got a nice finisher here, 366 litres of boot space around the back, but this actually isn't where the practicality stops for the Taycan. We have a little undercover storage for the charging cable. We've got boxes off to the left and right, no spare, however. What we do have though is a boot around the front. So we can press this button here, either close the boot or close it and lock the vehicle and we can head around the front to see the secondary storage space. Accessing the fruit of the Taycan Turbo can be done uh, from the interior, but it can also be done from the key, which like almost any Porsche is shaped like a little car. And if you pay, you can have this painted in uh, your vehicle color as well, which I would do. So we've got a separate button on here for the frunk or fruit. We reach in and it has a traditional latch a bit like a bonnet on a combustion car. Now that opens up to reveal another 81 litres of space, uh, which is actually good enough to put a small wheel on cabin bag, the kind that would fit in a uh, A320 or something like that. That'll get in there absolutely perfectly. Otherwise in here, it's pretty sparse. We've got our warning triangle and we have our windscreen washer fluid. That's about it. And then this comes down and much like closing a bonnet, it's just a simple case of giving it a firm press to close it. And with that out of the way, let's talk about the running costs, the charging, and the energy consumption of the Taycan. So what's it gonna cost you to run a Porsche Taycan? Well, like most full electric cars, the running costs can be attractively low, particularly if you have household solar, which I think a number of owners of this vehicle will have, along with a spot in a garage where it can be charged. For myself, without a PowerPoint in my uh, underground parking space, I have to use fast charging and ultra rapid charging networks, but the Taycan actually comes with a three year complimentary plan with ChargeFox and they have up to 350 kilowatt charges. This vehicle can charge at 270 kilowatts, which is among the quickest on the market, but not as quick as a Hyundai Ioniq 5 or the forthcoming Kia EV6. The Taycan has an 83.7 kilowatt hour battery and in my mixed driving with the vehicle, I've managed to easily score 22 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers, which implies a full range of around 380 Ks. But driving a little bit less frenetically, tapping less into this car's 500 kilowatts of power, you would be able to eke out a slightly better uh, energy efficiency score from it. However, charging up the battery from zero to full at home would cost you about $21 here in New South Wales at the time of recording. Service pricing on all Porsche vehicles is actually set dealership to dealership. There's no cap price servicing offered on any Porsche in Australia. I actually wasn't able to find pricing to service the Taycan at our local Porsche dealership. However, servicing for this vehicle is only required every two years or 30,000 kilometers because EVs have far fewer moving parts. So it's possible that service pricing actually hasn't been generated yet because the Taycan is so new. And lastly, the warranty on the vehicle, disappointingly is only three years for unlimited kilometers on the whole car, but for the high voltage battery, it's eight years and 160,000 kilometers. But while the Porsche Taycan is stylish outside and has a luxurious interior, particularly this vehicle, it's really all about the drive in this electric car. What really sets the Taycan apart from vehicles, including the Tesla Model S, is just how polished the ride and handling of this EV is. Now, I've already spoken at length about that in our review of the Taycan 4S, so I'm not gonna rehash my commentary in its entirety, but the Taycan Turbo serves up all of that goodness and even more pace. 
And that's what I'm gonna be speaking about as we take this Taycan Turbo out for a drive, particularly how it's able to contain its 2,300 kilo mass better than just about any other vehicle I have ever driven. Or at least that's what's meant to happen in theory, but a heady cocktail of suspension technologies, basically the state of the art for how to suspend a vehicle has been employed by Porsche on the Taycan to make it handle like one of this manufacturer's combustion sports cars. And to put it bluntly, it's worked. Unlike any other EV we've tested, the Taycan is not just capable of tackling complicated technical corners at high speed, but it's simply capable of riding well, no matter what the situation. Usually the significant mass and inertia of a large battery in an EV makes vertical body control very difficult. Individual wheels tend to thump in and out of bumps and they just ride in a kind of overly stiff, starchy manner most of the time. But not the Taycan and not even on optional 21 inch wheels in very low profile Goodyear Eagle F1 tires. This still rides incredibly well on that package. So how have they done it? Well, it starts with adaptive air suspension. Uh, and this is all standard at the turbo level. Uh, on some of the lower grades, you have to tick these options, but you should tick these options rather than uh, a black pack or something like that. This is actually what makes the Taycan great to drive. So it starts with adaptive air suspension. There's Porsche active suspension management with adaptive dampers. There's electromechanical active anti-roll bars, which keeps the vehicle really flat. And there is Porsche Dynamic Chassis Control Plus. And so it's a combination of those technologies, most of which are fed uh, via the high voltage battery in the vehicle and are able to respond instantaneously because of that connection. Uh, that is what keeps this vehicle so stable, so comfortable, so compliant and so controlled over a very, very wide variety of bumps, imperfections, and through a broad system of corners. The ride quality is by far and away better than competitors like the Tesla Model S, for instance, and it will take a very, very special suspension in something like a Mercedes-Benz EQS uh, in order to best this vehicle, but we'll wait and see uh, what turns out when uh, that vehicle launches here in Australia. So as I mentioned, if the grade of Taycan that you're wanting to purchase doesn't include most or all of that, those would be the very, very first option boxes I would tick before anything else ostentatious because that's actually the mixture that makes this the best EV on the market to drive. That being said, the powertrains are not shabby at all um, and this car can really move. And as you start to walk up the range of Taycan, they do get extremely quick. Um, culminating in a Turbo S with over a thousand newton meters of torque and a sub three seconds zero to 100 time. Even the turbo is insanely powerful, 500 kilowatts of power from the dual motors and 850 newton meters of torque, all available instantaneously. Turn on the uh, Porsche electric sport sound. jam the throttle down and this is one of the quickest cars that you probably have ever ridden in if not the quickest it has mind-boggling capabilities to get up and run but as I mentioned it's actually the ride and handling which is the truly sparkling element of the Taycan's dynamics but <laughs> you know the ability to just jam on even 50% throttle and get an insane response immediately uh, it doesn't really get old Speaking of that sport sound, it's designed to give it a bit more sort of oral character. I don't mind it. You can toggle it on and off very easily. It costs about a thousand dollars. I'd probably do it for novelty value. Now underneath this car, the 4S still makes 420 kilowatts of power if you option the performance battery plus the bigger battery, which becomes standard on the turbo and turbo S. And underneath the 4S is actually a single motor rear wheel drive variant with 300 kilowatts of power and 345 newton meters of torque. So it's mainly torque, which is reduced on the base Taycan, but it's still really more than enough. And that's a lot of power um, for the system to be generating. Uh, and of course, it's just gonna give you a bit more crispness in terms of throttle response. And rear wheel drive is also gonna give you some nice crispness push from the rear end, no pull at all from the front end, which certainly doesn't dilute the experience on the dual motor variants, but there's nothing like the lightest version in the range, the rear wheel drive, and 
you know, combine the rear drive version with choice options, um, copying the turbo suspension layout, uh, and you will have yourself an absolutely phenomenal EV, state of the art type stuff. In terms of the rest of the experience, it's quiet in here. Road noise is actually fairly minimal despite the aggressive tires. 305 section at the rear of the car, very, very wide tires, expensive to replace, but you do get significant traction from them. You sit really low. That's another thing that marks the Taycan out against a lot of EV competitors, which mainly take an SUV shape. Uh, you sit really low, typical Porsche driving position. All of that's been nailed in this car. The view out is good. The aperture out the back is pretty narrow. Steering is actually really nice. Very, very quick ratio, very precise, and actually a bit of road feel, um, which is terrific. Probably one of the better electric power steering systems out there. Just makes this car enjoyable and engaging uh, to drive. And you look for reasons to drive it, which is always the mark of a, of a great car, a captivating car. You actually want to get out there and drive it as often as you can. For anybody that already owns an EV and is sort of thinking about taking their experience to the next level in something like the Taycan, probably the biggest difference you'll notice immediately when you set off is the fact that the Porsche doesn't really have conventional regenerative braking. You can force it to do regen braking when you lift off, but the way Porsche wants you to drive it, and it's set by default every time you start up, is if you lift the throttle, it just coasts. Now, I know it's, that's heretical to most EV fans out there. That's fine if you want that sort of head snapping regen or alterable regen through paddles. You don't get that on this car. It coasts, but then as you push the brake pedal, you actually get regen braking. 90% of the braking force is regen in everyday driving, Porsche says in this car. But it actually just is a very natural feeling brake pedal. Far more natural brakes um, than virtually any other EV we've tested. And the fact that it makes its WLTP claims in terms of energy efficiency without relying on regen, I think makes it quite impressive um, because you really can just drive this like a combustion vehicle. You don't have to work your way around EV-esque quirks. And just as I said in my review of the Taycan 4S, which was kind of like my first extended taste of, uh, of the Taycan, this vehicle is very much a Porsche first and an EV second. And I think that's probably what's appealing to the hundreds of Australians who've purchased one of these this year. This has actually been quite successful for Porsche in Australia. It's outselling the 911. Obviously that itself is a niche car, but I think it says a lot that uh, they're having some success with it. Lastly, on the safety front, AEB and Adaptive Cruise Control are standard on this car. They're not standard on every Porsche. You get lane keep assist and blind spot monitoring and the 360 degree camera included as standard fare as well as you really should at this price point. So those are my impressions of the 2022 Porsche Taycan Turbo. I don't actually think you need the turbo. If you want a Taycan, which I completely understand because it's actually the best EV on the market at the moment, in my opinion, I actually wouldn't go past the base rear wheel drive in the sedan or just the Taycan 4 in the Cross Turismo station wagon. I think that rear wheel drive is the purest choice in Australia, not many of us actually need all drive. If you are planning to go to the snow or something in this kind of car, then the vast majority of the ranges in both sedan and wagon have dual motor all wheel drive, so that could very well suit you. But I think for about half the price of this Taycan Turbo, the base rear wheel drive is the way to go. Still absolutely beautifully, crisply suspended, quick, interesting to look at and luxurious to sit in. That's the Taycan I'd have. Very keen to know your views though. Let me know down below this video in the comments. While you're there, make sure to hit that notification bell. And as always, thanks for watching Chasing Cars.